to your at-home worship. And in our scripture today, it's the three denials of Peter. And it's just part of our tradition that one of Jesus' own closest denied him three times. And as we'll talk about in the sermon, we remember that not because it's so extraordinary, but because it's it's just so common, and, and we all do this in, in many different ways. And that's part of what happens in Peter, all the different ways that the denial happens. As we'll talk about in the sermon, though, that's not the end of the story, that we have a God who constantly pursues us, who, whose mercies are new every morning, and that's why we are free to worship without fear. It's, it's why we are bold to pray. So... All of those things that are stacked against you, that might keep you from worship, put them aside because Jesus has on the cross. And let us come to him now in prayer, Luther's morning prayer. We will pray together. Let us pray. I give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected me through the night from all harm and danger. I ask that you would also protect me today from sin and all evil, so that my life and actions may please you. Into your hands I commend myself, my body, my soul, and all that is mine. Let your holy angel be with me, so that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. And right away, here at the beginning of worship, we get to the heart of God's mercy. We get to the heart of what today's scripture is about. The confession, which is where we stand with Peter, and the forgiveness, which is where Jesus crosses that line and stands with us and brings us to him all over again. So let us confess our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's children say, Amen. God of mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you and against others, both knowingly and unknowingly. You call us to love and we hate. You call us to peace and we bring violence. You call us to be generous and we are greedy. Lord, for these sins and all that we confess now in the silence of our hearts, We have merited your wrath. Forgive us, Lord. And so now receive your absolution. In the sermon, we will talk about what Jesus does. But let's save that for this sermon. Suffice it to say, for now, here's some preparation for what happens in the scripture. In between Peter's three denials is Jesus standing fast, standing firm, not giving up an inch, proving faithful. And so when you want to look for where it is that you will find how you'll stand tall before God, Don't look to your accounts, but look to the one who stands in between them, Jesus Christ, who proves true for you, and who does so, once again, in these words. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, all your sins are forgiven. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. So our worship continues now with some time of reflection and prayer.
the Holy Gospel according to John, the 18th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Peter had always been so sure that if the moment ever arose, he would stand tall for Jesus. Good old Pete just knew he had it in him that he had the makings of an excellent disciple for Christ. Martin Luther referred to this kind of narrative about oneself as a glory story. A, a movie wherein we star as the lead actor a script where we are the main character who carries the weight of the entire drama. And we love these glory stories, don't we? <laughs> we look at our lives through them and we like to see it mirrored back to us in our movies and television and even music. And in fact, that's pretty much all you get. Those stories where the protagonist pulls themselves up by their own bootstraps and digs deep and goes the distance too. Yes, in the course of the story we do ex expect our heroes to stumble just so long as they don't outright fall, fail, or fold. That is what's not allowed in the glory story. However, that's not how it goes in today's scripture, is it? And this is because we're dealing here with the Bible. And the Bible isn't Hollywood. The Bible is real life. Defects and all. Defects and all. What happens instead in our scripture is that Peter, under really just the slightest amount of pressure, caves in completely. And meanwhile, it's Jesus, the one Peter thought he would be standing tall for. It's Jesus who stands firm. It's Jesus who doesn't give an inch. It's Jesus who doesn't blink in the face of serious peril. 
and the salt in the wound is that while Jesus is confidently asserting that Caiaphas can learn anything he wants to know about Jesus from those who heard him speak, one of Jesus' own closest confidants, Peter, who surely heard Jesus speak plenty of times, Peter is denying even knowing Jesus. No doubt that's not how Peter imagined the night going down when he confidently asserted that he would lay down his life for Jesus. However, that's how it all shook out that rotten evening. Peter's reputation was finally on the line. So much for that old glory story. Now, honestly, as sinners, with this nagging estrangement from God, seeing ourselves as the sole protagonist of our stories is an inescapable part of life. And it even serves its purpose at times. However, this tired old tale, it is not the full story. And most certainly neither is it the final one either. As useful as these glory stories might be for getting the garbage to the curb or the taxes filed, because that's not going to happen unless you see yourself as the main actor. You see, as useful as the glory story might be for that sort of thing, what the glory story can't do is vindicate. What the glory story can't do is redeem. What the glory story can't do is rescue. The glory story is actually a closed loop. It is a sentence to what the author David Foster Wallace called the confines of our own tiny skull-shaped kingdom. You see, and those were the four walls Peter felt closing in on him that night. Now, this part isn't in our passage, but this harrowing experience that is in our passage, it sent Peter fleeing. After that wretched cock crowed, we don't hear from Peter again. Until, that is, Mary Magdalene tells Peter Jesus' tomb is empty. And Peter, he checks this out for himself, and seeing that he can't help but believe, however, he doesn't have any faith Jesus' now vacant tomb has anything to do with him or his story. And so off Peter goes. And then the next we hear about him, uh, a chapter or so later, we find out that Peter has gone back to the family business, that he's called it quits on being, uh, being a disciple, that he's thrown in the towel, that he's packed it in, that he's learned the hard way he didn't have it in him, to be a disciple for Jesus after all. Not that fishing was working out so well for Peter either. When we drop in on him again, Peter has just spent the night failing at even his fallback. <laughs> However, this string of failures, it's not enough to scare Jesus away. Not by a long shot. In fact, what happens is Jesus comes to Peter again. And in the process, Peter learns there's an alternative to that old glory story. However, he learns this lesson while undergoing the painful one that the story that's the alternative to the glory story, the story that's new every morning, well, it rings loudest when that glory story can't say anything. When our failures are so massive, the glory story has nothing to say and so leaves us sitting in our own failures, shortcomings. But you see, that's right where, came, that's right where Jesus came to Peter. Came to Peter after Peter spent another night of coming up empty. And while Peter is contemplating calling it quits, Jesus turns up to him yet again. Although Peter doesn't know it. And what this undercover Christ does is offer Peter some advice. And the worst kind of advice to the unsolicited kind. Peter is finally so far at the end of his wits, though, he's willing to entertain another voice. And so he takes this mysterious guide's lead and casts his nets yet again. And no sooner do those nets land than Peter catches the payday to end all payday. And that's not all either. Not even close. 
Because while they're hauling in their catch, that other disciple notices that that enigmatic advisor is none other than Jesus. None other than Jesus. And then with a fervor that belies profound guilt, Peter lets go of the nets, he dives off the boat, and he makes a break for Jesus. And when he gets to Jesus, Jesus is cooking breakfast around a charcoal fire. A charcoal fire. You might remember that from today's scripture. That's what the the servants are warming themselves around when they ask Peter if he's one of Jesus' disciples. You see, and undoubtedly, that smell wafting through the air, it takes Peter back to that night. That night when he denied even knowing Jesus. And with that stench of betrayal lingering in the air, Jesus, who knows everything, puts a question to Peter. But it's not if Peter's ready to go back at it. And it's not if Peter's learned his lesson. And it's not even if Peter is sorry. Rather, Jesus just asks Peter if he loves him. And Jesus lets Peter answer three times too. Now, of course, this guts Peter. But Jesus isn't retreading old wounds to rake Peter over the coals. No, rather what Jesus is doing is redeeming the past for Peter right there on the spot, in the present, in the now. And the way Jesus does this is by transforming the incident from one of performance into one of love. Into one of love. You see, that old glory story, in the end, it never held anything for Peter. But blessedly, Jesus comes to free Peter from this story, to give Peter another story, one where it doesn't all hang on Peter's shoulders, but rather the cross. You see, and it's that story, and that story alone, that redeems, that holds a future, that has a place for you and me. And this story, it rings loudest when the glory story has nothing to say. In the face of setbacks. In the face of letdowns. In in the face of outright defeats. But you see, that's what the cross represents. How Jesus takes them all onto himself and transforms them by the power of his love. And so if you've got a string of letdowns trailing you, You're right where Jesus wants you. Because every time we hear Jesus' word, we do so with that glory story blaring in our ears, don't we? And left to this glory story, we would think that it meant that we had to pack it in in our pursuit to be a disciple for Jesus. But what this incident reveals, what this incident reveals is that that it doesn't hang on our efforts. (laughs) Rather, it hangs on the cross. You see, Jesus has no problem working with deniers and betrayers and deserters and just all in out failures because that is the raw material of Christ's ministry, the cloth he cuts his redemption from. The only thing any of us, including Peter, have to offer is the grace of God. The grace of God Jesus extended to Peter that morning and the grace that Jesus extends to you this morning or whenever you happen to be participating in this service. Jesus doesn't need disciples for him. No, he's come to make disciples of him. Disciples who have been freed from carrying this burden that we can't carry and frankly were never meant to Disciples who have stood on the receiving end of Christ's mercy. Christ's mercy that transforms our inglorious stories into the glorious story all of Scripture has been building to all along. The story of the cross. You know, at this point in Lent, we're hurtling toward Easter. And we all long for some of that Easter glory. And make no mistake, it's breaking in on you. It is. Only it's happening where you least expect Not where you stand tall, but where you fall short. For it is there that the cross stands steadfast. And it stands steadfast for you and for me. 
Jesus transforms our faithlessness into his righteousness. And he does so all by the power of his love. And he does so right now. Jesus doesn't wait. He doesn't hold back. And here it comes. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and especially of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You are free. Go in peace. Amen. We continue our worship with giving thanks for the gift of God's Word. After each petition of thanksgiving, I will conclude with, For your word of life, O God, and the response is, We give you thanks and praise. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke life, light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word, you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, and wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. And so now send your spirit of truth, O oh God, rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O oh God, draw near to all who call on you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. 
to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so now, be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. And so let us continue to lift our voices and thanks to God with our hymn, Let Us Sing Together. and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And we conclude with our charge, that prayer Jesus himself gave us. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so, we invite you to stick around for a few brief announcements right after this. But now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We pray that this time of worship, you got to experience a little bit of letting go of that burden of trying to be the main character in your own story and, and let Jesus carry that weight. We pray you, you experience some of that. And we pray that... It carries you through the rest of this day and week and through Lent and to Easter and beyond too, and that you might know some of the freedom Christ has come to give for freedom Christ has set you free. Uh, as far as announcements go, it's really gearing up toward the end of Lent and rushing into Holy Week, which is going to be here soon. April 14th is um, Monday, Thursday, and we'll put out a simple special service like we did last year, but we'll have our in-person services here at Faith Lutheran on Sunnyside at 6.30 p.m. That'll be Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Vigil. And we'll do Easter Sunday on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And if you want to worship with us in person, why, we'd certainly love that. Um, it's always good to, get, it's good to worship together during those services, but we'll have uh, an online one offered as well. Otherwise... You know, those are really the big things. There's other stuff that's going on, and you can find that on our website. And there's a, it has our website at the end of these um, 
at the end of this service. So you can check that out there. So blessings on the rest of your Lent and Holy Week and heading into Easter. Thank you.